Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live session today. I will be going over a quick startup presentation to welcome you all and introduce you to our program and various opportunities if you have not previously attended our shadowing session. So Prehealth Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic status, abilities, or location. So my name is Muntaha and I am the Editor-in-Chief here at Prehealth Shadowing. Thank you all for attending today and let's get started. So just a little PSA, we do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate all students. And this setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you need assistance enabling this, please direct message one of our team members, either me or Lorelei, and we will help you enable your transcripts. You are all, we are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure that our sessions are accessible. So if you have any recommendations on ways we can improve, uh, there's our email at the screen, info at prehealthshadowing.com, and you can always email us and talk about any improvements you recommend. So since this is an international program, we want to know where you are, are Zooming from. Uh, drop it in the chat. I'm actually calling from Florida but PHS headquarters is in California. Let's see who we have. We have people from Chicago, New York, and Mississippi, all over the country, that's nice. Um, let's move on. If you want to stay in the loop, we do have our social media. We have our Instagram and TikTok. You can follow us there. On our Instagram and our email list, we let us people know when our sessions are coming up. So be sure to check it out and stay in the loop to never miss a session. We have some wonderful opportunities for you all as benefits of being part of the program. We have partnered with Kaplan to get our students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products, as well as free resources, such as study guides to help prepare you for standardized tests like the MCAT, NCLEX, PCAT, or GRE. If you fill out our short survey in the chat, we will get you signed up for all of these details for free. Our Neolith is a free mental health platform. And if you sign up with the code PHS15, you get a Neolith for free. And you're, if you're interested in psychology internships or you wanna look at their certificate opportunities, you can definitely check out Neolith and look at the different aspects of mental health and the training that they have with you. And this is for completely free if you sign up with PHS. We also want you to draw your attention to another amazing program we've partnered with. This is a women-led business, Mask for a Mask. So what they do is whenever they sell four masks, they will donate four, four other masks to uh, people in need, like those in the homeless community, under-resourced hospitals, just uh, health professionals without proper PPE, and just generally any other people who are in need. So you are able to get 15% off with your first order with our code here. Our code is PHS15. You can get a 15% off your order. And if you buy through this method, Free Health Shadowing also gets 10% of the proceeds which is amazing because we are a nonprofit that runs solely off of our community. If you want to play a bigger part in supporting PHS, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be a part of the, our administrative team and our student volunteers. And we have initiatives such as professional outreach, grant writing, volunteering, and editing. So you can definitely check that out. We understand that as a pre-health student, you may not have the time. So we also offer the opportunity to volunteer asynchronously with tasks that can be done on your very own time. So you can sign up to either be a team member or a vol asynchronous volunteer with the links in the chat. If you are a high school student and want to get involved, we have started a program called HTP, which means High School Training for PHS which allows you to connect with college pre-health programs, get involved in fundraising for PHS, and to organize resources for other high school students interested in medicine through pre-health shadowing. We want to recognize our hard work and the students that contribute to our platform. So if you have any thoughts and ideas and just want to flesh it out into an article, reflection, review, or success story in your life, 
Uh, the reviews can be of live sessions and just previous speakers. Please submit your uh, writing to www.prehealthshadowing slash blog submissions. I'm actually the editor in chief, so I'll be reading your work and I really look forward to reading your work from this session and other past sessions if you had any thoughts to flush out in writing. We humbly ask that everyone donates to our program. As you know, pre-health shadowing is completely student run and we are working around the clock to keep this free. So if you'd like to donate, please visit the links in the chat. If you don't, if you don't have the ability to donate, please send it to others who may, might, may, maybe they can. Um, otherwise, we do ask everyone to share the word about free health shadowing, maybe to the people in your school or your friends or anyone you know, just so that we uh, are out of students who don't have the proper education are just rejected from shadowing opportunities and they can visit PHS anytime. So throughout our session, we would like everyone to uh, type your questions in the chat. We will be keeping track of these questions and we'll have a short Q&A session uh, with our speaker after her presentation. Uh, just a reminder to take good notes because we have a post shadowing assessment, which is a 10 multiple choice uh, quiz. I'll talk about it later after the uh, presentation is done, but you do have a shadowing assessment to just verify your hours and get your certificate. So be sure to take good notes. Lastly, if you can, we request you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation as we are respectful of your circumstances, but it does help us feel closer together. We also request that you make sure to mute yourself as this will ensure the professional has the complete and full attention from the audience and there aren't any unnecessary noise and distractions. Um, so I appreciate you all for listening. And now I would like to welcome the professional Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Richard. Uh, you may start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Let me just stop sharing mine. All righty, let's get this set up here. All right, can you guys see the screen okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Dr. Sierra Richard. I am currently a women's health and pediatric clinical pharmacist and the founder of Happy Farm Life, which I'll talk about later at the end. But today I really just want to go over what I do as a women's health pharmacist and just kind of give you a background into what a pharmacist does, because I think a lot of people don't know exactly what all goes into being a pharmacist. So my objectives today for you guys is really to explain the process I took to become a women's health and pediatric pharmacist. I will go over some other things as far as things that other people have done in the different paths, because there's definitely not one single path to get here. I will also discuss what um, a night in the life of a women's health and pediatric pharmacist looks like because I am an overnight pharmacist. So this is my week off and normally I'm working in the middle of the night. I'll also describe the role of a pharmacist within women's health because that's the space that I really um, focus on when I am at work and then discuss the ways pharmacists learn about women's health outside of pharmacy school. So first I wanna start off with a polling question just to get a better idea of the audience I have here. So what healthcare professions um, or profession are you most considering? So I can kind of tie that into some of the pieces of my presentation later on. Just gonna give it 10 more seconds so everyone can answer. All right, so it looks like we have a lot of physicians um, as well as some nurses, some advanced practice practitioners, health admin, some pharmacists, and medical academia research. Okay, so that gives me a good idea. We have a variety, but definitely stronger in the MDDO space, so I will keep that in mind. 
So for pharmacy school, if you've looked into medical school, it sounds like a lot of you have, we have very similar prerequisites. Um, you can major in whatever you want to get into pharmacy school. I had a classmate who was an English major. I had classmates who actually majored in theater. So it really does not matter what your major is. A lot of people will go chemistry route, um, some biology route or biochem, depending on what the schools offer. I was a double major in biology and chemistry um, when I was in undergrad, and it just really depends. But these are the core prerequisites that you're going to see for most schools. They're, it'll vary between schools. So general biology, general chemistry, microbiology, anatomy and physiology, calculus, organic chemistry, which is always a rough class. Um, general physics, which was my roughest class because I am not a physics fan. Um, English composition, communication, and speech. That's a huge part of being a pharmacist is communicating with patients and providers. Statistics, which is really important in understanding medical literature. And then biochemistry, as well as just various other things that the schools may want you to get involved in. Some of these you can take in high school if it's like a comp class that you can take or clep out of as well so it's not something that you necessarily have to take all of them during undergrad but you'll have to have them at some point so during college another big thing for pharmacists is having some sort of extracurricular activity schools look for not that you're just having good grades but that you also are doing stuff outside of the classroom so having some sort of job in pharmacy or in some other healthcare field pharmacy is preferred just so because you have an idea of what's going on but rather just having some experience in a pharmacy even if it's just shadowing is important Organizational involvement, if you have any opportunities to be involved in a leadership role of any kind, as well as recreation. I mean, I was a part of a soccer team, an intramural soccer team all throughout undergrad, and that was something that I actually talked about in my interviews, things that, you know, balancing that plus some of my leadership roles and having a job in pharmacy while being a student. Um, research, if you're able to, if you want to go to pharmacy school, you don't have to get a full bachelor's degree. I did not. So research may not be something you can get involved in. Um, I was not able to because I only did two years, but I did have classmates who did the full four years and did research during undergrad and then some sort of volunteering. It doesn't really matter what it is, if it's in healthcare or not, just getting out there and volunteering with the community. For me, um, one of the things I did is during holidays, I was with an organization that would make meals and deliver them to elderly in the community that didn't have family there, so they weren't alone for the holidays. So we did that around Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter and things like that just to make them feel less alone. So definitely not medical, but was also a great opportunity to interact with the community. So getting into pharmacy school, um, they talked about Kaplan. I used the Kaplan resource to study for the PCAT which is the pharmacy college admission test. It's not required for every school anymore, so that would be something to look into, but most schools still do require it. Farmcast is the application software that they use, and the good thing is you can fill this out and basically apply to any pharmacy school. So you'll do essays and a personal statement, transcripts, letters of recommendation, usually it requires three to five. You'll include your DPA, any test scores. So for the PCAT, some of them still required your ACT or SAT scores to be entered, and then extracurricular activities that you completed while you were in undergrad. And then after your application is reviewed, then you will have the opportunity for an interview. Um, hopefully next year, those will be on site. Last year, I know a lot of places were doing virtual interviews still. So I kind of hinted that you don't need a bachelor's degree, but how long do you guys think it takes to become a pharmacist? So some people say two years. I wish that was not an option. Three years, typically four years to six years. So six years wins, and that would be our correct answer here. So you usually will have to do at least two years of undergraduate studies. 
Um, and then as far as your additional time in school, you will do most likely four years. There are some three-year programs, but the majority of programs will be four years. So the vast majority of pharmacists will go to school at least six years to eight years of schooling before you graduate. And then there can be additional training later on, which I will talk about um, something that I completed after school before practicing on my own. So the pharmacy school structure. So traditionally, you will have a four year program that will do the first two years um, as didactic or classroom learning. The third year is where you start doing more experiential learning, which means outside of the classroom, you're in pharmacies, whether that's in a hospital setting or in that retail pharmacy setting that you're familiar with, like Walgreens, Walmart, independent pharmacies, things like that. And then the last year of school is completely outside of the classroom where you're going to different pharmacy practice settings and you're learning hands on and finishing out your schooling in that manner. There is block style learning, which a lot of medical schools, pharmacy schools are moving to where you're covering all information about a specific disease state or organ state system at once. And that usually occurs from the first one to three years. There will be some experiential learning that may go along with that throughout. And then that last year, again, will be all experiential learning. And like I just mentioned that most schools are the four year, but there are a couple schools that do accelerated programs where it condenses all the PharmD curriculum into three years. This requires summers and minimal breaks. So there'll be breaks of one to two weeks between each semester and they'll do three semesters a year and just go year round. And then that last year still will be pretty much that all experiential learning. They'll get the same number of experiential hours as anybody else would. And then no matter what, all structures will have graduates end up with a doctor of pharmacy degree. So um, I will at the end of pharmacy school, all pharmacists in the United States, at least, will be a doctor of pharmacy. That does vary between um, countries as far as if it's a doctor degree or a bachelor's degree. But in the United States, it's now a doctorate. So for pharmacy school didactic classes. We basically focus on drugs, not really something that's surprising. That is our wheelhouse is the medications. So top 300 drugs is one thing that you'll take right out of the get-go where you basically are just memorizing drugs. You're memorizing the name of the drugs, the brand names, the generics, how the medications work, what the side effects are, what counseling points you need to tell patients, just the big ideas behind those medications, the big drug interactions, things like that. Medicinal chemistry is where we get down to the molecular level and learn how drug reactions work and how drugs are broken down into the medications that we see that are active in the body. Pathophysiology is more so away from the drugs and just learning how the body works at a molecular level because pharmacists, we look at everything at that microscopic chemical level. Pharmaceutics class is an interesting class where we learn about the drug delivery systems. So how is a medication excreted out of a patch that you put on your arm? How do extended release medication formulations work? How does a sub-Q medication work over a long period of time if we give it for, say, a psychiatric illness? Things like that. And we look at that um, exact mechanism that those medications work. Pharmacology class is a, one of the most difficult classes that we go through in pharmacy school. And that's where we go through the nitty gritty details of how these drugs work. And this is where things start to come together a lot is where, you know, we've memorized those top 300 drugs, but this is where we start to understand why those side effects occur and how this medication works and why it works for certain disease states. Um, health economics class is, was one of my least favorites. I'm going to be honest. I was not an economics fan. I would rather be in a hospital. This is more a retail based, but how do pharmacists get paid? How do healthcare systems get paid? Um, kind of the business side of medicine, which was not my wheelhouse at all. Um, Evidence-based medicine was actually one of my favorite classes on the flip side, where we learned how to critically evaluate medical literature and read an article and decide whether or not it's something that we can apply to a patient or a group of patients that we are treating. Leadership and management, pharmacists are leaders. We are running pharmacies. We are the usually the person there, even if there's pharmacy managers. I am in the middle of the night. My pharmacy manager's not there. I am running the pharmacy. I'm running the show when I'm at work. So learning how to lead is very important. 
Um, pharmacotherapy is really the glue that sticks everything together. It is applying the medical knowledge we have to patients for specific disease states. It's where we learn the treatment algorithms for diabetes and heart disease and those big big drug classes and really put the things together that you need to know as a pharmacist. Pharmacokinetics is the math side of pharmacy. So there are certain medications that we look at and do drug levels on. And so that's one of the things that we learn is how to do the calculations to determine the appropriate dose for a patient for their drug levels. We also are just learning how certain medications work, how medications that start out in an inactive form become active, the chemical um, reactions that are going on the math we could do to see is this medication being stored in the fat cells of a person or is it not being stored in the fat? Where else is it going? And so we look at those different math equations during that. Pharmacy calculations, on the other hand, is more the day-to-day -day calculations that we do to figure out a compound for a patient or figure out how we are going to dose a patient for a certain medication. Ethics is, of course, a big one where we talk about the ethical dilemmas that we may face as a practicing pharmacist. Patient-centered communication is where we learn how to do drug counseling with patients. And it's really a very good opportunity to talk about, you know, making sure that we are using patient-friendly terms and making the complica complicated drug information that we have in our head easy for a patient to understand. Sterile and non-sterile compounding is a fun class. These are hands-on where you learn how to make medications. A lot of the medications I make, being in the pediatric space especially, is not straight from a pill. It's not a pill that we pour out of a bottle. We're having to compound those medications specific to patients, and we learn how to do all of that. We made ointments, creams, lip balms, gels, you know, just anything you can think of, suppositories, little trochies, which are like gummies. We made lollipops, all kinds of fun stuff out of medications for patients. Immunizations, um, pharmacists are able to immunize in all 50 states now in the United States. So this is the class where we learn all about immunizations. And unlike a lot of people think, we don't do this for two hours. It was a very rigorous course. It's actually over a 20 hour course if you were to take it for CE credit that we take as pharmacists where we go over every aspect of immunizations, the history behind the disease they're treating, the how the um, vaccine works, all of its ingredients. And then at the end, we learn how to vaccinate and then we continue to do vaccine clinics. I vaccinated hundreds of patients as a student. So it's a big opportunity to also help the community as well as vaccinators. Toxicology, oh, sorry, pharmacy law is the next one. Um, all pharmacists are required to take a law exam for each state that they are licensed in. So this is a overview of both the federal laws that are in place surrounding pharmacy, as well as whatever state you are in for pharmacy school, they usually go over that as well. Toxicology is, Everything from, you know, magnesium poisoning to what happens if a patient ingests bleach to too much Tylenol, things of that nature, those common ingestions that we see, how do we treat them? And then just the basic principles of toxicology. Something that you may not realize is that if you call poison control, one of the people you may talk to is a pharmacist. They're frequently on the other line. A lot of these are actually based out of children's hospitals and Pediatric pharmacists are the ones who specialize in toxicology and they'll be on the other end of the line. And then you can have a lot of electives. Some of the things that I took that I was interested in was nutrition, and I also took electives in pediatrics because that's what I was interested in, but there was options for oncology, critical care, and things of that nature. So when I was in pharmacy school, my goal was to become a NICU clinical specialist. And the things that I did in school to try to achieve that goal was I interned at a Women's and Children's Hospital. It's actually the hospital I currently work at. Um, this gave me the opportunity to gain mentors in the field. I volunteered at events with children and took my pediatric elective. I also had leadership roles through the American Pharmacist Association, Academy of Student Pharmacists. It started out as local roles, and I ended up serving as a national representative on the student as the student representative at the national level for the Governmental Affairs Committee for the American Pharmacists Association. And I also did research in the NICU with the NICU pharmacist where I worked because that was the area I wanted to go into. 
I'll talk about later how my goals um, changed over time, but these are the things that I was focused on while I was in school. And the other thing I was focused on was, okay, these are all the things I have control over, but I also wanted to really focus my experiential learning in those areas. And so my school, I was thankful to be able to rank the areas I wanted. I actually was able to go into the NICU during my time as a student um, and serve in the NICU. So experiential learning is a huge part of pharmacy school. So you have two different types of experiential experiential learning in the United States, you have the IPPEs or the introductory pharmacy practice experiences, and then APPEs, which are your advanced pharmacy practice experiences. And so the IPPEs are focused in more community and hospital pharmacy. And really the goal is to start practicing your patient counseling skills. You get a lot of face-to-face -face time with patients during these rotations. It's giving you that introduction to reviewing patient medical information. You'll have access to patient charts, be able to talk about certain patients that you're following in the hospital with your preceptor. And then it also just gives you a basic overview about what life looks like if you were to work in a community pharmacy or a hospital pharmacy practice setting. And it's really just that introduction. You're not going too deep or nitty gritty into the details because that's what your advanced pharmacy practice experiences are for. So the IPPEs occur earlier in your year, so it'll be, you know, closer to the second and third year of school, and then the APPEs are that ending rotations that last year of school. So you can do these in any practice area a pharmacist is in that has agreed to be a preceptor. I'm a preceptor, um, so I do that in the hospital setting in the pediatrics women health space, but there's also community pharmacies that you can go to, various pharmacies academia. So what does it look like being a pharmacist who teaches as a professor? Management rotations, I was able to shadow actually my current boss um, for a month and learn what he does on a daily basis and what goes into being a pharmacy manager. Ambulatory care pharmacy, which is more of a clinic setting. So they're in like your general family health clinics to specialty clinics helping with medications. Um, managed care rotations, these are working more with like your insurance companies and then industry. So working for a pharma company and being able to spend a month there. And there's just tons and tons of different opportunities um, throughout the year. And so you can choose at most schools where you would like to rank and you can kind of rank which ones are most interested in and hopefully get those. I did everything from being in the VA, helping manage diabetes to the NICU, to psych, to community. Um, it just kind of varied and I did all kinds of different things and was able to really focus in on what I wanted to do. And that's where you kind of figure out what you want to do with the rest of your career. And the goal at, at the end of each of those rotations is to be able to practice as the pharmacist on the team. And so this is really where you're putting all those pieces together. During pharmacy school, extracurricular activities are also a big component, especially if you want to stand out. Pharmacy is a very competitive field right now, and it's almost an expectation to have a job in pharmacy school, whether you are having a job in community pharmacy or a hospital pharmacy. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to work a crazy number of hours, but having some face time in a pharmacy during pharmacy school is pretty much an expectation now. Pharmacy organizations and being involved in those is also um, pretty much expected in a lot of different spaces um, of the industry now. So having leadership is really expectation. It's not just joining these organizations, but also being involved, volunteering at events. We had events where we were doing blood pressure checks, diabetes screenings for patients, giving vaccines. Um, I went into schools and we taught patients about medication safety. Um, networking opportunities are also a big part of this. I was able to meet a lot of people that helped me get to where I am today through these organizations. And then it's also a lot of fun. I got to travel all over the country through my leadership roles and I got to go to Washington DC like four times in pharmacy school. I went to San Francisco, Nashville. Um, I went to Houston, Texas. So just getting to do that in pharmacy school was also really fun. Research is another big thing um, that's not expected unless you are wanting to go into a residency or fellowship afterwards, in which case it is a bit more of an expectation. Um, I did research 
with the hospital I was currently working at, but you could also do that through the school. So residency training is something that is not required for pharmacists. However, it is becoming more and more of an expectation for those who are wanting to work in the hospital setting. So you can do a postgraduate year one, which is more of a general pharmacy practice experience. Postgraduate year two, which is more in specialty areas such as cardiology, intensive care unit, emergency medicine, pediatrics. Um, at the institution I was at, you could do pediatrics oncology or pediatric critical care. And then this is mostly clinical training. Fellowships um, can be done with or without prior residency training. And they're typically dedicated to a specific practice area. If it's from a clinical standpoint, more research focused, or fellowships are also done for industry and are particularly focused areas somebody's interested in. So governmental affairs, medication liaison, things like that. So for me, I did a postgraduate year, run, year one residency at a pediatric institution. So we have requirements for rotations, just like we do during pharmacy school, where we rotate through different areas, but we also are staffing and serving as a pharmacist. You do 80 hour weeks, you were working all the time. I basically lived in the hospital. Um, I did 12 days on, two days off for the entire 13 months of my residency. So I staffed on the weekends that I worked in the emergency room, the NICU or the central pharmacy, just depending on where the need was. And then we did some rotation. So we actually got to do an asthma camp where we were camp counselors for kids with asthma. And um, by the end of them wanted, wanted to be a pharmacist. So that was my claim to fame at camp, but it was a really fun opportunity to see these kids. We were able to do things with them that they don't normally get to do, like ride horses or run around or have mud fights, things that these kids maybe won't be able to do at home, but we were doing proper pre-treatment. We had medical staff everywhere. Like most of the camp counselors were like us that were medically trained. So we knew what to do if something were to happen. That was also part of my pediatrics rotation. So this is general pediatrics. Most of that is infectious disease or orthopedics. So dealing with broken bones, dealing with patients who come in with urinary tract infections, upper respiratory tract infections, things like that. The NICU is the neonatal intensive care unit. It's my favorite, the babies. Um, pediatric ICU is a little bit mix of everything where I was at had a neuro ICU as well as a regular pediatric ICU. And so these are the more intense patients. This is where we saw our patients who had COVID-19. A lot of them went to our pediatric ICU because we were able to isolate them in one of our units. I did nutrition services where I wrote total parenteral nutrition orders for all of our patients in the NICU. Um, this was a very interesting experience. It varies between institutions, the involvement that pharmacists have, we always will be involved in the compounding and the final check to make sure everything is appropriate from that standpoint. But I was actually writing the, the orders and then the physician just signed off at the end. So the physicians weren't the ones writing the nutrition, it was the pharmacist. Um, investigational drug services was one of my favorite rotations. I did this during the pandemic and was able to work with the FDA, write the treatment plan for our patient getting remdesivir, which was at the time experimental for pediatric patients, and then worked with our infectious disease doctor to get that approved and acquired for a patient, which was really exciting, and the patient ended up having a full recovery. Management rotation was also fun during the pandemic. We were getting to see all of the meetings that were going on, determining staffing models, and just the day-to-day -day job of being in charge of a pharmacy, especially as large as ours. There was over 200 um, pharmacy staff members at the hospital I was at, so a very large operation to manage. Medication safety is a specific job for a lot of pharmacists and health institutions. And a big part of just being a pharmacist in general is making sure we have safe and, a medica safe and effective medication therapy. So learning how we can build those structures, what we can do to make things safer for patients and make our processes safer so there's less likelihood that an error can occur. Hematology oncology is just what it sounds. We were doing pediatric oncology regimens and learning the basics of that. And then at the end was precepting, learning how I could teach students um, in my future career, which is something I do now. 
So the next question is, what does a pharmacist do? It's going to have five more seconds. You guys, 100%, you guys are great. So yes, we verify medication orders. We also monitor therapeutic drug levels, but we are not involved in the diagnosis. We get the diagnosis and then we help with the treatment plan. So let me talk a little bit about what my current job is. Um, because it is a little bit interesting being a night pharmacist. So currently I work at a women's and children's hospital, women's and children's hospital. So I'm a pediatric and women's health clinical pharmacist. I work seven days in a row and then get seven days off. So it's like every other week I get a little vacation, even though I sleep for a good portion of that because I'm just so tired. But I work Monday through Sunday, 9 p.m. to 8 a.m. So 11 hour shifts. And during my night shift, I cover our entire 100-bed hospital, give or take, depending on our current census. During the pandemic time, we were closer to 70, 80 patients. We're now filled up again, so we're over that 100-bed mark when you count our NICU beds. Um, but we have an emergency department for our pediatric patients, and we, all, we take anybody who comes in. So sometimes I have 80-year-old men as well. It just kind of depends on who wanders in our ER in the middle of the night. Um, we also take care of general pediatrics floors. We have a maternal health and labor delivery unit, needle and needle intensive care unit, pediatric intensive care unit, and then a fully functional operating room that operation orders usually start around 4 a.m. but can happen all throughout the night as well. So a night in my life is we do more than just those two things that were in the quiz, but I Primarily, I'm focused on verifying medication orders. Any single medication order that a doctor places has to be reviewed by a pharmacist at some point. Now, if you're in the ER and the labor and delivery unit and it could be emergent, they don't have to wait for us to verify it. I will usually get to it before they pull it out of the machine, but they are able to override those emergency medications because we don't want to delay care for me to review an order. But for the vast majority of the time, I will see it before they pull it. But a pharmacist has to look at it and at least double check after it's given that everything was safe and effective because it wasn't, we may need to have some sort of intervention. Another big part of my job is answering drug information questions. I am at an academic medical center, so we have a lot of learners there. And so especially at the beginning of the year when we have new interns, they are asking a lot of drug information questions, but nursing also asks us information questions about, can you know, administration, can we crush a medication, can we... Um, give these two medications together, or are they going to interact? Things like that. I also monitor therapeutic drug levels, which I talked about before. So certain antibiotics, we actually have a pharmacy consult service. So if it's vancomycin, gentamicin, tobramycin, these are common medications that have drug levels. The doctor will just put pharmacy to dose service in as the order, and then pharmacy will place the original order, follow them, order all of the drug levels, change any of the doses as we see fit based on the patient's um, drug levels and renal status and all of their clinical factors that could play a role in that medication. I'm also checking a lot of sterile and non-sterile compounds. Occasionally, I'll make them myself, but I do work with at least one technician at night. So majority of time, I'm not there by myself. If they're there, I'm just checking their work. If not, I am making them myself. And then I'm monitoring any other technician activities, which may be pulling medications for individual patients as they get ordered and delivering them to the floor, things of that nature. I also will complete clinical chart reviews of our Women's Health Service patients on nights that I am able. Sometimes it's crazy busy. Um, it's not a possibility, but whenever I can, I will do that as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then we also serve as a member of the rapid response team. So the women's health chart review process, basically as a pharmacist, I'm going through and looking at the big things that may be medication related for a patient in the women's health space and trying to determine if they have everything that is safe and effective for them and is the best standard of care of practice. So I'm looking at things to kind of get an idea of the patient, like their reason for visit, the gestational age, you know, how far along in their pregnancy are they? 
What's their renal function? Because that can affect drugs. What's their liver function like? Um, what delivery method they either had if they are postpartum or if they are going to deliver, what method is the plan? Any fetal concerns? This is important for me being there by myself at night. So if we think that the patient may need heart surgery immediately afterwards or has some sort of other issue, um, such as like the mom currently has an infection. So if she delivers tonight, we're going to need the baby to have antibiotics. These are great things for me to know to anticipate needs because antibiotics as quickly as possible out of the womb is important. Certain medications, if they have a heart condition, needs to be started within 30 minutes, things like that, we need to know ahead of time. So it just keeps me aware of what's going on upstairs. So when deliveries do happen, we are ready. All right, Stace, at our H status is also important. So if the mom is RH negative, there is a medication that we give for that. Um, blood pressure and UA results. So their urinary analysis, um, we're just kind of looking to see, you know, is there any concerns for preeclampsia or any other concerning factors, blood glucose levels, um, what their feeding plan is. If the mom is planning to breastfeed, we need to monitor the drugs that we're ordering to make sure that they are safe and effective for breastfeeding moms. Um, contraception plans whenever they leave. Do they want to be on birth control pills? If so, what kind? Do they want an IUD? Because we'll need to give them one of those, those sorts of things. We also look to see if they are COVID-19 positive. Um, if they're symptomatic, we do give medications now for that. Um, group B strep is the deadliest infection for neonates. So if the mom is positive for that, we will actually give antibiotics prophylactically. So we'll make sure she's on the right antibiotics. Um, for the right period of time for that as well. We'll look at her rubella status. If she is rubella negative or not immune, then she will get the MMR vaccine before she leaves because rubella can be deadly for babies and they can't get that vaccine right away. So we'll give it to mom instead. We also look at STD status to see if there's any prophylactic measures we need to give to the baby upon delivery. And then her vaccination status, these are the main vaccines, the Tdap, MMR, COVID-19 and flu shot that people will get if they're in season. And so we'll just wonder about those and make sure that she's got everything she needs if she wants to consent to those. So the next polling question is, what is the role of a pharmacist during emergency situations? So thinking like a code blue situation or a rapid response when a patient is no longer breathing or doesn't have a heartbeat. We have 80% voted so far, so I'm just going to give it seven more seconds. All right. Okay, so some people just thought it was the monitoring, uh, monitoring the timing of med doses, but a lot of you got it correct that it was all of the above. And actually, um, being the only pharmacist at night, there is a lot that I do when it comes to rapid response team. So one thing that we do, this can vary at night because I'm the only pharmacist and I'm having to monitor so many other things when there's a rapid response. I don't typically draw up meds at the bedside. I have before in different roles. When I was working in the ER, I was always drawing up meds at the bedside. Um, but at night, I will usually be entering verbal medication orders. So the physician is calling out and running the code. My job is to help them in whatever way I can. So they will give me verbal orders. I will be putting it in the computer so we can print any labels that we need to make. A lot of this stuff is not at the bedside that we need to make once we've got the patient somewhat stabilized. So medication drips and things like that, we are making in the pharmacy. So I will be taking verbal orders from the physician in order to get those entered. I will also recommend drugs or drug doses. So the physician will call me and they'll be like, the patient has high potassium. What do you recommend that we give? I will give them a recommendation based on the patient. And sometimes they'll ask me for specific doses for a drug that they're wanting to start. Because again, they're calling out the codes. So maybe they may not have every single drug memorized and the doses memorized. So that's where I can come in. Um, I have a lot of a little cheat sheet that I keep on my badge for a lot of these emergency drugs, especially the ones we don't use quite as often. So I can quickly have that ready to go. 
Um, I also watch the timing of doses. So we know based on the pediatric advanced life support algorithm, what is the best timing for each dose to be given. So if we're at that mark, the next time we can give up an effort and I'm saying, hey, we can give epinephrine again. Do you want to give epinephrine? And they'll say, yes, I'll hand them the drug and we are good to go. So that way the physician is not watching their watch and watching the patient and watching the vitals. We're going to be doing that one part for them. They frequently will ask how many minutes since the last dose? And they'll be like, okay, we're only at two minutes. We'll have to wait another minute to give a dose, things like that. It's all about that communication during a rapid response. I'm also checking IV compatibility. So a lot of times we're adding multiple IV medications for a patient and they may only have one line. So what can we give in that one line that's safe and effective? If the rapid response was called by a possible toxicology, we'll be working with poison control, reviewing the toxicology and the recommendations for reversal of that agent if it's possible or just management of that agent as well. Um, the technician frequently will be helping me by making sterile compounded items, and I'll be checking those, running those over to the floor as needed with the technician. Um, we'll also be adjusting fluids based on their electrolytes. So we'll be looking to see, is there potassium high? Is there sodium low? Are these things that could be contributing to what we're seeing now and adjusting their fluids based on that? And then, yes, pharmacists can actually be a part of chest compressions. I've personally never done it. I know many pharmacists who have, especially in mass casualty situations where, you know, you need to rotate out. You need to give people breaks because that is a very strenuous activity. So pharmacists, if they're in the room, can be asked to help with chest compressions, especially in those mass situations. And so as far as women's health goes, this is a new space for pharmacists to kind of be a part of. And we are just now seeing um, some talk about it. So really the first time I had seen it since joining the practice of pharmacists was in December of 2020, the American Journal of the of Health System Pharmacists, which is our main organization for um, hospital pharmacists, um, presented a article just talking about where pharmacists can fit in. So they cited the fact that there were 3.79 million births in the United States in 2018, and we were seeing a rise in maternal mortality rates. So we see a rise in the age of maternal patients. We're also seeing that black, indigenous, and persons of color are affected at much higher rates. And we're also seeing an increase in complicated pregnancies. So with all of that considered, we're seeing more moms who are pregnant getting medications. And that's where pharmacists can really come in and help play a role. Unfortunately, right now, there's limited didactic and experiential training during pharmacy school, and after pharmacy school is not much better. There are less than 20 pharmacy residency programs with obstetrics rotations, one of them being where I currently work. And so there's just not many opportunities for pharmacists to learn about this, but it is definitely an area that is growing, and we're seeing more and more of these residency programs pop up, and we're actually seeing several schools um, put into place some classes for pharmacists to learn. And so where pharmacists are currently being placed for this is rounding with obstetrics and gynecology teams, being a part of that rounding and decision-making process. We're monitoring home medication use for clinical appropriateness. This is something I do every single time somebody's admitted. Look for their medication list, see what needs to be started now, what is urgent, what is necessary for them to have while they're here. Um, contraceptive management, making sure they're on the right birth control form, whatever they choose, and also giving them education if they want to figure out, you know, what form of birth control they want, but don't know all of the details, we can give them those as well. Discharge counseling, so any new medications that may need to start, we don't always send patients home that are have delivered. We have patients that will come in with acute issues. We send them home on new blood pressure medications or medications for gestational diabetes, so giving them proper counseling on that, as well as educating on medication use and breastfeeding. Um, there's a lot of medications that aren't considered safe in breastfeeding that you or I could take on a daily basis, so what are those medications and what can you use instead? as well as quality improvement projects. This is something I do a lot on night shift is identify ways for us to improve our current order sets or our current policies and procedures to be more evidence-based and better practice for our patients. And then clinical recommendations and complicated patients as well. So 
I frequently um, talk to our OBGYN residents and make plans with them for patients for antibiotic treatment and things like that. And then vaccination monitoring. Again, all of my moms, I'll look at their vaccination status to see if they're up to date on everything that we could give them while they're here. So the next question is in what ways can pharmacists improve women's health care? Perfect, you guys got it. We're really focusing right now in pharmacy on adding that additional training and rotation opportunities um, regarding our women's health patients. So since there is a lack of that education, some things that we are doing now is offering more shadowing. Sometimes that's with OBGYNs and sometimes that's with pharmacists such as myself. Offering more rotations to students. I'm taking, I think, six or seven students this year on my clinical rotation. So I'll have several students that will have the opportunity to learn about women's health from me directly. And then residency training and programs that will offer women's health or obstetric services. Continuing education is also very important, which is how I got a lot of my training aside from my on the job training that I got as an intern working at a women's and children's hospital as well as a pharmacist. And that's through organizations such as American Society of Health System Pharmacists, um, the American Clinical Pharmacist Association, and then our Power Pack and U.S. Pharmacists all have great information about women's health. Um, there's also textbooks. So I have access being at a um, teaching hospital, the same textbooks that our residents have up have access to. So I frequently reference them and read them, especially if there's updates. And then clinical guidelines. I'm always reading um, guidelines from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology or the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine is another great resource, as well as the Society, American Society for Reproductive Medicine. These are all organizations that I look at frequently, especially in our complicated patients to see what guidance we have available. Most of these organizations work really well together and their guidelines don't contradict, but they do sometimes have um, different secondary or tertiary recommendations. So especially a patient who's failed a couple therapies, it might be good to look at multiple guidelines to determine what might be best for the patient that we're currently treating. And since this is an area that a lot of pharmacists don't know about, I created a social media page, so Happy Farm Life, on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, where I'm focusing mostly on women's health topics, as well as on my website, happyfarmlife.com, to hopefully try to help bridge some of that gap, as um, a lot of pharmacists don't get that information. So with all of that, I've done a lot of talking, and I want to hear from you guys. So what questions do you guys have for me? Thank you so much for that informative presentation. We've learned so much. I personally did not know the amount of training that you have to go through uh, through your education. So that was really, really interesting to learn about. Um, so for our question students, you can definitely put your question in the chat and direct message me. Um, a lot of people have been messaging me about questions. So let's get started. Um, Julian asks, have you had to do an intervention due to a wrong prescription? Because you were talking about how pharmacists kind of check the prescription that the doctor provides. Every single day that I work, every single day I make interventions. I did a post not too long ago and in one week I made 60 medication interventions. Um, I was just tallying them up. I didn't realize I made that many. Some of them are minor where it's like, it was just, they click the wrong checkbox and I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure they don't want to give this medication IV because the patient doesn't have an IV. I think they meant to give this orally, so I'll call them and change it. But a lot of them can be serious. Last week I had three or four that could have been life-threatening medication errors that I caught and intervened on. It happens very frequently, especially in the hospital setting. You're dealing with a lot of medications that are for critical patients and 
um, I'm doing a lot of math. Every single one of my orders almost is calculating weight-based doses for pediatric patients or weight-based doses for women's health patients. We do that for all of their antibiotics because their pharmacokinetics are different being pregnant and they have different fat stores and blood volumes than we have for a patient who's not pregnant. So I'm doing a lot of those calculations by hand and double checking what the physician did. Um, we also get a lot of critical ICU patients. And so I do interventions every single day that I work. Um, sometimes I walk in and I do two or three right off the bat when I walk in the door, it just depends. So um, that is what we do. And a lot of people don't realize we're doing it. The patients have no idea that we're doing that for them, but we're there anyway. Awesome, thank you. Um, he had another part to his question. He's asking if physicians are held accountable if they keep making like the same mistake so many times or if they have like a life-threatening mistake. So what's very important for um, any healthcare professional to realize is we have a culture um, where we don't want to blame the person who made the mistake. First and foremost, we want to look at the systems in place that caused that to happen. So the whole point of medication safety is not to point fingers and be like, you made a mistake, you're wrong, because I've made mistakes before. But we look at our system to see what happened. Is it the way that they ordered the medication that made it more likely for that mistake to happen? So for example, the ones where I say like they clicked the wrong checkbox, is IV automatically checked? So it makes it easier for them to they have to actually physically go and uncheck it and switch it? Um, is it something that they have to go to another screen to see what they made a mistake on? Those sorts of things to see if there's some way we can make it easier and safer for patients on that system. If the doctor makes the same mistake over and over again, then yes, we're going to intervene and we do keep track of that. We have a reporting system that can be, you can report anonymously or you can tag your name to it where you report any medication errors and we look at the system. Um, there was one this week that multiple people were involved in and we realized that one of our training documents had wrong information in it and that was where this problem stemmed from. It wasn't that the nurse did it wrong or that the resident did it wrong or that I told them wrong. It was that our training document was actually wrong and so it wasn't any individual's fault. It was the training document's fault. So those are the things that we look at to see if we can fix. If somebody does something that is blatantly unsafe and there's been um, the issue is brought up. So we actually had an incident um, in past years where a physician blatantly ignored the pharmacist recommendation when they told them it was contraindicated and they should not give that drug, in which case that physician was held accountable for that because there was documentation that the pharmacist said it was unsafe. There was documentation that the nurse said it was unsafe and they did it anyway. Um, so those are situations where the individual will be reprimanded, but we typically are looking at what systems and mechanisms in our health system cause that error to occur versus the individual themselves. Sometimes it is individual training. There were things that I didn't order right or didn't realize were wrong when I first started because I was new and I didn't realize that that order was not correct based on how it was entered because it should have been entered in a different one and that should have been inactivated. That wasn't my fault. That was a lack of training because there was no way I was going to know. And thankfully, nobody got hurt from any of those errors. They were things that just the nurse couldn't run and we had to re-enter them. Um, so things like that happen frequently. And we just really want to focus on what we can do to make it the safest for everybody. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for sharing your experience. Um, we had another question uh, from Kyra. She asks, how long did it take it take before you knew what specialty you wanted to go into? So I first was in retail pharmacy. I actually worked in a retail pharmacy in high school and through my undergrad. And at first, that's what I thought I wanted to do. And then I also really love to work with kids. Like I would go volunteer at summer school to work with kids in high school. And I just always really liked working with children. Um, and so when the job opened up my first year of pharmacy school at the Women's and Children's Hospital, I went to work there and I fell in love immediately. I loved not just the pediatric patients, I love the women's health side of things as well. 
Um, one of the things I really enjoy about my job is I can take care of mom and baby, which is really cool. So some of our moms are there for weeks at a time while we're taking care of her if she's on bed rest or observation. And then I can be there the night of delivery and we deliver the baby and then we get to go over the NICU and then I take care of them over in the NICU. And so it's just a really cool experience. And I loved that as an intern. And so pretty much after working there, I was there for only a couple of weeks. And I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do with my life. I love it. I loved going over and seeing all of our patients. I mean, it's really hard, even though these are sick kids, to not be happy in a pediatric hospital because we would have these really sick kids and they're like telling you this story about like whatever they watched on TV today and they're like the happiest person ever and they're like flying an airplane in front of the nurse's station and you're like, okay, you have cancer, but that you can be this happy. <laughs> I, I have nothing to complain about. So I just loved the atmosphere at a pediatric hospital. I feel like the staff that I work with is super fun as well. So it didn't take me long once I started working in that atmosphere to say, you know, this is what I wanted to do. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, there was another question re in regards to specialties. It's kind of opposite from you from what you do, but the student asks, um, is there a geriatric specialty for pharmacists? And how is it different from uh, pediatrics and like regular like adults? And the can you talk about the medication? Absolutely. Oh. Um, geriatric pharmacy is an area that's increasingly growing. And so from a pediatric standpoint, we're more focused on like weight-based dosing and we don't have as much um, information about a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Women's health and pediatrics are considered um, vulnerable populations. So they're not typically included in the initial clinical trials that are done. And so that is something that we have to deal with in pediatrics, whereas in geriatrics, you have a lot of that information. A lot of that information is guideline-based, but really where pharmacists come in is what we call polypharmacy. And that is these patients have multiple disease states. They're on drugs, on drugs, on drugs. And we're looking at the carousel of medications is what we call it. And so you look at, okay, they're on this medication. Is that to treat a side effect of this medication or is that a different disease state all of its own? Is there any of these medications we can get rid of? If they have a new reaction, they're looking at the new medications that were added or any of these potentially contributing to that. Is there drug interactions going on? Can we pare down some of the pills that they're taking? Can we make the drug burden a little bit less on them or change formulations of drugs so maybe they don't have to take pills four times a day, they could take it two or three times a day. And so geriatric pharmacists are huge. They also are very involved in hospice and in the life care in some institutions. And so those pharmacists can be critical in providing comfort to patients um, and working with um, pain and palliative care physicians to come up with the best treatment plan for patients and keep them as comfortable as possible at end of life care as well. Um, there's actually some programs where I'm at that go and go into homes of farmers in our local area, and they'll look at the medications of these older farmers and try to help find medications that keep them working on the farm because that's important to them. So maybe adjusting their medications to make them less dizzy or drowsy so they can operate machinery again. Um, there's a lot of different ways that pharmacists can impact geriatric pharmacy. It's just very different than what I do in pediatrics, but equally as important. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question we've had is, I've been told that children have great immune systems. Can you explain why children and women are considered vulnerable populations in regards to like vaccine, uh, having volunteers for vaccine? So, it depends on the child's age, whether or not they have a good immune system. We'll start there. So our neonates, their immune system is not great. Any um, antibodies that they're getting are usually from their mom, which were passed down at birth, or if the mom is breastfeeding, they're able to get the antibodies from them. As they get older, they do get better and their immune system learns. They're able to fight off infections a lot easier than adults typically are. Um, the vulnerable populations comes in more so from the aspect of consent. So, and it's also a very historical thing and I don't have time to go into all of the aspects of medicine and women's health and the yeah. patriarchal um, side of medicine and 
thoughts behind women's health. Um, that's a whole nother talk on its own. But with women's health, the original thought was women are born with the set number of eggs. We don't want to harm the fetus. So we're just not going to give them the meds. Um, cause originally women weren't actually included in clinical trials at all because they didn't want to harm their eggs that they could potentially have in the future. So now we've moved to at least pregnant women. And so there's, even if they have animal trials that say that it's not likely to harm in pregnancy, they will wait until the drug is approved and shown no harm in the general population before they will give the medication to a pregnant woman. Similar with children, um, they kind of do it in a stepwise approach. So if you guys have seen that the um, some of the COVID vaccines are now approved in 12 to 16, so that's another population um, step down and then you'll go 12 to like six or two, or six to two. So they'll like slowly move their way down, checking them. So the reason for that is mainly the consent piece. They don't want to harm kids or um, they don't want to harm a pregnant woman's fetus. And those medications, they don't have as much pharmacokinetic data on for those populations. They are very different. So they will avoid giving those um, until they've seen it safe in the general population. That's currently just the way it's done. Pediatric consent is also a complicated thing, which I learned in my investigational drug service. Um, the consent forms you and I would do to get in a clinical trial are definitely um, less in depth than what you're gonna get if you had a pediatric patient because parents are consenting for the kids. Um, so the patient themselves are not gonna be able to consent. Um, and so that's another factor and another risk that the drug company has to take if they're going to include pediatric patients. And a lot of them just choose not to do it initially. Um, really the only exceptions you'll see is if they are trying to do a medication that is to treat a pediatric specific disease state or a pregnancy specific disease state, but we don't see that incredibly often. Usually pediatrics get these studies afterwards. Some drug companies won't even go after pediatric um, like approval. They'll just rely on outside use instead and outside trials that we do on our own after it's marketed and we're using it off-label. A whole lot of the stuff that we use is off-label, unfortunately. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. I just want to remind our students that if you'd like to ask a question directly to our speaker, you may raise your hand and I'll ask you to unmute. Um, so Jaden has raised his hand. Jaden, you may unmute and ask your question. Um, yeah, so so you were talking about um, how during rotations and, and um, potentially during residency, a lot of mm -hmm. people will ask questions like, for example, like if two medications will interact. And um, so uh, I myself, I've, I've had to take multiple medications and I'll occasionally just put it through an online like drug interaction checker. And I was wondering if if in your experience, like there's anything that those sort of like online checkers or the like like that people can access really quickly, like miss out on that, like doesn't take into account the full expertise of a real experienced pharmacist. So I would say yes, because what I've learned, so we have paid checkers that we use. So we don't use like drugs.com I know has things like that. And so a lot of those drug checkers will tell you everything that could possibly come up ever that they have seen and is reported in the package insert, but there's also things and nuances that they don't take into consideration, such as like the stacked effect of multiple side effects. So um, it's not always seen. So maybe it's like these two medications could increase the side effect just a little bit and these two medications could increase it, but now you're taking all three together and it's increasing it significantly, but the drug checker may not catch that. And so the paid drug checkers that we do usually we'll catch more things than like if you put it through drugs.com, they actually did that in school. One time they put the two medication list and a lot more things came up in the paid one that we use, um, which is called LexiComp. It's kind of like the pharmacist. I don't know any pharmacist that hasn't used LexiComp at some point in their career because it's just a great resource. And so I'll put everything through there, but then I look at it from this standpoint is this actually a clinically relevant interaction? And so a lot of these interactions, it'll say, oh, this could be an interaction, it's a level whatever, but the doses don't match up for that to actually be a level C or a level D because they're on super low doses. 
um, or maybe it's actually more severe because they're on the max dose of two of these drugs and it says it's not that big of a reaction but now that we've maxed out on them it actually can be more serious than what it, the drug interaction checker is saying so a lot of it is clinical judgment and so sometimes i'll look at these and i'll be like this is saying it's QTC prolonging, um, which is something we see more in like elderly patients and are more concerned with an elderly. So for my pediatric patient, I'm probably not nearly as concerned unless they have a clinical disease that may cause that at baseline. And so I'm taking into consideration all these things, the age of the patient, their history, the other drugs that they are on, um, that sort of thing. And so we get a lot of these questions and we're just trying to figure out based on that particular patient, what those drug interaction take that are actually relevant um, because not everything might be. So it becomes pretty complicated and I will be honest, it's still one of the harder things for me as a new pharmacist to learn, um, but I've just gotten better and better at time parsing out what's actually most important for our patients and the pieces that really matter to patient care. I hope that helps. Yeah, for sure. And I guess like that for me, I have the follow-up question then of, I guess, like, how do you, um, like, I, I guess, are you required to continue doing training? Like even after you're certified as a pharmacist, that just seems like so much to keep track of and like just so many factors to consider. Yes. So it depends on each state, how many hours of continuing education you're required, but you do have to take in my state, at least 30 hours of continuing education. You can also get specialized. Um, I don't qualify yet for pediatrics because you have to practice for so many years. It's similar to like medical specialties where you go through residency, but then you have to actually practice for a certain amount of time before you can take the exam. Um, so hopefully eventually I can take the pediatrics and be certified there. But in those cases over like a seven year period, and it depends on which certification, you have to take like over a hundred hours of continuing education on that particular specialty. Um, and then I just do, I read something almost every day when I'm at work because I am at night and so we'll have like a lull down and so I'll read a new ACOG guideline or an update from Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine and I mean I'm just constantly reading we get email updates, especially for major alerts or drug recalls that sort of stuff that you sign up for and kind of just skim the big important things that you need to know so it's just a constant learning battle. Um, if you want to go into medicine and stop learning after you get out of school, this is the wrong field for you because it's a every single day I'm learning something still. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. You're welcome. So, quite a bit. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jaden, for asking your question. Uh, Glynis had a question. She, uh, they ask, is it true that prenatal vitamins are better for your health than regular daily vitamins? So vitamins are a tricky thing um, because what vitamins everybody needs is kind of individualized, right? Depending on your diet, depending on what your um, concerns are medically. So I never like broadly say anything about vitamins. Um, women who have childbearing age, we typically recommend prenatal vitamins just because if there were to be um, an accidental pregnancy, prenatal vitamins, and in order to get the correct amount of folate, it's actually more critical in that time before you actually realize that you're pregnant than, you know, oh, I figured out I'm pregnant, now I'm taking them. Not that that's saying that you'll have an issue otherwise, um, but the current trials say actually starting a prenatal vitamin at least three months prior to pregnancy is the best way to get the most bang for your buck out of prenatal vitamins. So um, there's not really anything wrong with taking a daily vitamin or a prenatal vitamin. Um, I wouldn't say that the prenatals are better for your health than a regular vitamin though, unless you are trying to conceive or considering trying to conceive in the next three to six months. Um, so, yeah. Awesome, thank you for that answer. Um, another st uh, student, Alex, asks, do you have any suggestions about obtaining medical experience during undergrad years? I know you've had a lot of experience with the neonatal clinic and pediatrics, but in general, what do you think about pharmacists and what, what kind of suggestions you would have with pharmacists having medical experience? So I think any medical experience is helpful. Um, and I know a lot of actually physicians who were pharmacy technicians and undergrad or throughout college because just learning the medications and being around them was very helpful and just learning that process. 
So it really just depends. I know um, people who have worked as like medical technicians or like up on the floor as patient advocates. I know people who have, you know, just worked on the phones as like an operator at a hospital, just learning all the different departments in a hospital. Um, and then they went on to be a pharmacist or a physician or a nurse. And I think any of those things can be very helpful. Um, working as a pharmacy technician, I think is really the best way for pharmacists though, to get that experience, just because you're in a pharmacy, you're in that setting. And then I think me being a pharmacy technician and then also a pharmacy intern while I was in school makes me a better pharmacist because I know what the pharmacy technicians are doing, especially since I used to work where I am now. So I know the expectations of the technician, which makes it easier to manage the activities that they're doing now as the pharmacist. And it also allows me to step in and be helpful to them when they are slammed because there's some times where I've made it through all the orders. Now they're having to fill all of these orders, but now my queue is clear and I don't have any medications to verify. So I can go help them fill these orders because they're really busy and we don't have the time to, you know, wait around to get them all filled, especially if there's stuff we're having to compound. Um, so I can be helpful in that manner as well or deliver medications or do those technician duties. So I think that made me a better pharmacist and also more empathetic of the job that the technicians do. Those people do not get paid nearly enough for all of the things that they do. And I think just being in that role before really helps. Um, but honestly, if you're gonna go into medicine, just having any sort of experience is gonna be helpful. Thank you for that. I was just looking at another question. Um, they asked, how do children obtain antibodies from breastfeeding they were saying that they thought that whenever you breastfeed, when a child breastfeeds, they just digest it and it just goes through the, their digestive system. So how do they get antibodies from breastfeeding? So definitely um, not my pharmacist wheelhouse exactly, but I guess the, I'm trying to figure out the best way to answer this. So mom has antibodies, which can be passed through the breast milk. And yes, the baby is digesting them, but it also, when it's going through their body, their immune system will react to those. And um, that's the easiest way to describe it. Again, I'm not an OBGYN. I've just seen the data that says these things. So um, you probably should ask an OBGYN or a neonatologist for better information because I'm not a lactation specialist by any means. Thank you. Um, another student asks, uh, what kind of, like after undergrad, during pharmacy school, what kind of experiences really helped you decide that this is what you wanted to do specifically in women's health? Did you have any experiences in pharmacy school that um, really like had that uh, for you just saying, this is what I really want to do? just working in that women's and children's hospital space. And I also really recognize from the pharmacists that I work with that women's health is a big disparity in pharmacy and in general. I mean, we should not be seeing rising more maternal mortality rates in the United States. There is no excuse for that um, as a Western medicine society that's, you know, got all of these opportunities and resources at its disposal and realizing that in a lot of the places where we're seeing maternal mortality rates being so high are areas such as preeclampsia or advanced maternal age and a lot of these patients are on medications and medication management is playing a role in this um, and so realizing that i was not taught in pharmacy school about the medications that we give during labor and delivery i learned all of that from my training as an intern and being an intern at a women's and children's facility. Um, and there's really no excuse for that. I mean, honestly. And so it was something I became passionate about as a woman myself saying, I don't think that it's fair or appropriate to completely exclude this population of patients from our medical training as pharmacists. So it's definitely an area I'm very passionate about because I have seen some of our patients come in and 
I've been able to help significantly improve their care because I recognized a drug interaction that was going on or that the drug that they were on, we could increase the dose and probably see a better outcome and then did so. And we saw a better outcome for the patient that maybe we're able to delay um, delivery for a few days because we were able to up that drug. And so those sort of interventions have improved, you know, not just maternal mortality rates, but maybe the neonatal mortality rates as well, because every day in the womb is increasing that chance of survival and increasing lung development, especially if we can get in the steroids for the neonates. So those are huge areas that pharmacists can be involved in. And so I saw that just working in a facility and knowing that the pharmacists that I worked with were all basically teaching each other and learning from outside sources. Um, and this is just information that's getting passed down to pharmacist to pharmacist in these hospitals. Um, but I also know that there's a lot of hospitals that don't have that opportunity, who don't have somebody who's passionate about women's health. And so um, I'm hoping that we'll see a change in that from pharmacy schools. That's something that not only myself, but several other pharmacists who are in this space are working on. Yes, I definitely agree with that. There's so many disparities that have to be checked and you learn so much about your field and your population as you go through like your uh, this more specialized schooling. Um, just for a last question, if you had any advice for our future pharmacists and pre-health students. I would say just be open to everything. Never did I imagine I was going to do women's health whenever I started. I was I was going to be a retail pharmacist. So I was going to go back home and work in retail. And I never would have imagined I would do um, residency in Texas. None of those things were things that I ever, I didn't even have residency in my wheelhouse. I didn't even know that was a possibility when I started pharmacy school. So for anybody who's going into pre-health, um, also, just take away your preconceived notions about certain specialties. I know they're out there, but you'll find that they're completely different once you're out there in the world. And just be open to those opportunities and take opportunities that make you feel uncomfortable. Take those opportunities that you feel like are going to help you grow and learn um, because you just never know what is going to end up being the perfect fit for you and what rotations you're going to like. And you may find out, you know, close to that final part of your schooling that you like something that you didn't even realize that you would enjoy. So being open and ready to take on anything that comes your way is just my best advice. And just keep being resilient and take time for yourself as well. Self-care is important during school. Burnout is real. So make sure if you start feeling that coming on that you're taking that time for you as well, because grades are not the most important thing if you're burned out. Thank you for that advice. I see Jaden has raised their hand, so Jaden, you can un uh, unmute. Yeah, I I'm sorry to sort of like interrupt your your very like inspiring like <laughs> end of end of like talk remarks and and kind of ask a more technical question. But I guess I was wondering like, so I I'm aware that in some areas of research and exercise medicine comes to mind that like a lot of the time the study like populations for certain things are disproportionately male. Um, and so I was wondering if you see those kinds of like when you're studying like pharmacy and pharmacokinetics and if there's any field like like subfields within that where you notice like that the, the study population doesn't adequately like um, I guess uh, look at like female or like pediatric um, populations as, as sort of like in terms of how how potentially like processes work or our medications affect them. Absolutely. It's a huge problem in medicine in general. So I think it was 2006 was when women were actually required to be included in clinical trials. Prior to that, they were not. So there's actually some major trials that are cited for like um, medication for painful intercourse in women that were done completely in male populations, such as male rats and things like that, which makes no sense clinically. But that is actually how it was done. And so we're even seeing now um, a lot of the animal trials are predominantly done in male rats. And so when you get to the clinical trial setting where women are included, um, frequently if they are included, it's not as proportional. We're seeing better numbers every year as far as equal proportions. But our a lot of our older medications and older data that we have is very disproportionately male, um, very disproportionately excluding minorities. I mean, you're seeing mostly your 70 kilo white male middle-aged human 
And that is where a lot of our older studies are. And that's very unfortunate. Pediatric patients are frequently another population where we don't get good pharmacokinetic studies on because if they were not opted into being a clinical trial from the drug company, which again, like I said before, a lot of our stuff is off label, then we are doing those studies like outside of that clinical trial setting. So you're having to kind of extrapolate data for some very small subsets of patients that are done at like children's hospitals. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing from the kinetic standpoint. So a lot of the stuff that we're seeing done we're excluding those populations. I'm hoping that with some of the new laws that are in place, so now, um, I don't remember what year it was, but now there has to be male and female rat studies done. So if they're doing those animal trials, male and female are required. That's a very recent change. Um, so hopefully we'll see better results on that. So for example, endometriosis drugs were all done in male rats where they took the endometrium for female rats and then implanted them in male rats and did the studies in male rats, even though endometriosis is a condition that is endometrial-like, but not actually the endometrium. And so it's like, we're still seeing these things. And those are fairly recent studies in the last like five years. So it's something that I look very, very much in the methods, um, especially if we're looking at an animal trial to see if that makes any sense. And then looking very closely at those populations to see if it's really something we can extrapolate. It's a huge problem that we're seeing in research. Um, and we're seeing more and more laws to combat that. And we're also seeing more and more patients advocating for themselves to be in clinical trials and be represented appropriately. Um, I have been involved um, more recently in the past couple of years with the endometriosis community. And they're a very vocal community who has been really trying to see a change in their research specifically. So I'm hoping to see more and more of that coming up and seeing some changes in those research um, methods. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, it, it seems, you know, promising at least that there's progress being made and it, it seems really great that pharmacists such as yourself are really concerned about this and working towards making sure that there's more um, equity among like patient populations. So that's really wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'd just say, like to say thank you again, Dr. Richard, for your thoughtful insight and your, and your response to the questions and your great uh, presentation. It was really clear and informative. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I think we learned a lot from our wonderful speaker today. So I'm just going to go ahead with our wrap up presentation to tell our students how to take our post shadowing assessment. All right, so because uh, we'd like our students to reflect and kind of document their thoughts when they go through these live sessions, um, I'd like to ask everyone to ask themselves what brought you to the session today, what are three major takeaways you got, and what do you want to learn more about after today's live session. This reflection isn't required, but we do encourage you to submit it if you have any other reflection uh, submissions to our website for publications, so you can recognize so you can recognize your hard work and enhance your future applications and just documenting your thoughts in this manner. If you want to learn more about free health shadowing and get involved in our program, we encourage you to visit our website. We have our team member applications. If you'd like to lead initiatives and projects and lead groups of people and volunteers, we have our opportunity for volunteering asynchronously with the first link um, on the screen. The second link is for the team members. Um, asynchronously volunteering means that you can do it on your own schedule and you don't have like actual obligations. So if you're free to volunteer asynchronously, please make sure you put the link in the chat. And once again, we are humbly asking that if you're financially able to, that you please consider, consider sending a few dollars to us via Venmo or PayPal. You can do this with the link in the chat. Otherwise, we ask everyone to spread the word about pre-health shadowing so we reach as many students as possible and students are aware that they are still able to shadow even though there's a COVID-19 pandemic and sometimes you might get turned away because of the current cases and um, things of that sort. So now for the part we've all been waiting for, how to earn a digital certificate. 
First, you will be going onto our website, which is freehealthshadowing.com, and you will be finding our professionals course page in the past courses. Our professional today is Dr. Sierra Richard. After you find her page, um, you can go ahead and finish her course viewing the presentation. And then we have a 10 question multiple choice quiz. All the questions are multiple choice and you have 30 minutes per attempt. So you have 30 minutes to take the quiz. We have two attempts um, and you have to have a 70% or higher, meaning seven out of 10 questions right to earn your certificate. Um, after this, if you have any difficulty with technology and need another attempt, you can email us at info at freehealthshadowing.com. Otherwise, we only allow two attempts. And after the quiz, once you've passed, you can click the finish course button. Make sure you click that button. And that way you are able to download your certificate verifying your virtual shadowing hours. If you missed a part of the session today or want to go back and view other sessions, and earn more certificates with verified virtual shadowing hours, you can go to our YouTube channel, Pre-Health Shadowing. We will have this session uploaded within 24 hours once everything gets downloaded and uploaded to YouTube. But otherwise, we have so many more sessions. If you're interested in pharmacy, we have so many other pharma pharmacists with their specialties mm -hmm. and um, other fields that are non-MD, DO, we have OT, PT, PA. So if you'd like to view those, you can definitely go onto our YouTube channel and you may take any uh, assessment you'd like from those sessions. I also like to add that our quizzes are open indefinitely. So you are able to take it today, tomorrow, next week or next month. It's up to you. But once you open it, you have 30 minutes and you have two attempts to take it. So just for our last announcement, just be sure to catch our sessions through our social media and our email list. We update our everyday sessions on our website on our Instagram posts and on our email list. So make sure to keep, a, keep track of at least one of those so you are updated on when we have our session. Uh, we are also uh, booked every weekday through June for virtual shadowing sessions. So I hope to see you guys in the future sessions and make sure you keep up to date. Thank you for joining us today and please stick around for any questions for myself and my team members we will be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'd like to make a one more quick announcement. We actually have a second live session today. Um, if you'd like to join, it is at 1 p.m. PST, 4 p.m. EST. And our session is with a nephrologist. Her name is Dr. Elise Barney. She's a DO. She is working in the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. And she has experiences with eating disorders and hospitalist medicine and global health. And she has a very diverse background. So if you'd like to view our session with our nephrologist at 1 p.m. PST, 4 p.m. EST, then uh, make sure to stick around. You can view it on our website. So otherwise, uh, our session today is concluded and officially over. So I invite you all to log off and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Dr. Richard, for being here. And thank you to my students. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Have a great day.